Alright, I am back with another video, and today we're doing, well, I suppose it's a build request. Uh, when I did my Wandering Swordmaster build last week, that being the Fighter Monk mix that used both Tavern Brawler and Great Weapon Master, I was asked to do a sort of evil counterpart. Somebody, a couple of people commented that an Oni build would be quite interesting. For those of you that don't know, Oni are kind of like these Japanese, uh, I guess demons, devils, they kind of have their own distinction as Oni, and they're basically known for being just kind of dicks, and are quite characteristically uh, depicted wielding uh, large wooden clubs with spikes sticking out of them. So I thought, you know what, I'll give it a shot, and I think I've come up with something rather interesting, a class combination that, to my knowledge, I haven't actually done on the channel before. So I felt like it was going to be a pretty interesting video to make, and I hope you all enjoy it. I really, really enjoyed making this build. Uh, you'll find that I've actually taken a few similar steps to how I made the Wandering Swordmaster build, as I kind of see these two as being diametrically opposed, straight up one for an evil run and one for a good run. In this case of the evil run, I think this character would be, again, somewhat of a wandering, like, kind of marauder, maybe a bandit or some sort of just completely blood-raged warrior, just somebody who kills for the sake of killing and, you know, to satisfy their own... I, I mean, you could play this as a dark urge if you wanted to satisfy your urges, but maybe it could just be to just satisfy their bloodlust, they just want to kill. So dark urge could absolutely work for this build, but I've not built it as a dark urge, but you can absolutely do that if you want to. And yeah, I think this guy is just kind of a big brute who's very, very strong, but there is kind of a caveat to his character. He is strong, but only for a certain reason, and we'll get to that later, but I think it'll be pretty obvious. So, let's get into the build. Uh, it's up to you if you want to kick things off with uh, this class here, which is Barbarian, or if you want to do our multi-class first, it's entirely up to you. This build is, a very, is very flexible, you just kind of want to end up with the same level scheme that I have by the end. But we are going to be kicking things off with Barbarian. In my opinion, Barbarian makes absolute sense for a character like this, uh, basically just being a big, screaming, raging brute who is going to be just beating people over the head with a, with a bloody old rusty nail covered bat so you know uh <laughs> i mean we're going to get rage so that means we're going to be able to deal a little bit of additional damage with our melee and improvised weapons as well as throwing and have resistance to physical damage which is nice we're also going to be getting unarmored defense using our constitution which is always nice to have although we cannot wear heavy armor as for our ability scores they're going to look really strange but it will make sense Strength is at 8, because I believe this character, a lot of their bloodlust, a lot of their rage, comes from the use of potions. In which case, these sort of cloud giant strength elixirs, or hill giant strength elixirs, that are going to boost up our strength to 21 and 27, depending on which tier you use. But I think these, you know, potions would have deadly side effects, including making him extremely angry, extremely prone to violence, all this sort of thing. So, as such, your goal throughout the game is going to be to be picking up as many of these potions as possible to keep your strength up and get your fix before your muscles become atrophied. Now, obviously, people who are in the know and make builds like this quite a lot, these potions are quite easily accessible. You could get three really early on in Act 1, and if you know how to space out your long rests, that's all you should really need. But the, I liked the idea of this character where being opposed to the Wandering Swordmaster, where the Wandering Swordmaster actually gained their strength through training, diligence, and practice, this guy just kind of took the shortcut and got his power through potions, and as such is a brutal monster. Dexterity is at 16, uh, this is just mainly here for our armor class and our initiative rolls. Constitution is at 15, uh, I've just, I'm going to be using a half feat to bump this up, but if you decide you don't want that half feat, feel free to change the ability scores around a bit. Intelligence at 8, we don't need it. Wisdom at 10, we had some skill points left over, and this is what I decided to put them in, so our wisdom saving throws aren't totally abysmal. And finally, Charisma at 16. I want this guy to be good at intimidation checks, and this is going to fuel some features we're going to be getting later. 
as for our skill proficiencies, again, if you went Dark Urge, you'd have the Haunted One background, so you'd get uh, Medicine and Intimidation, which is perfect. But I've chosen the Outlander background once again, as, again, I believe this guy would be out in the world quite a lot. So it makes sense for him to have both Athletics, which we do want for this build, and Survival, which is kind of just an add-on. And then we also gain Intimidation just because we are a Half-Orc, and Half-Orcs as well come with a really nice, come with a couple of really nice abilities like Relentless Endurance and the ability to, um, you know, get extra damage on a critical hit, which is going to be really nice for this build. You'll see what I mean as we get to it. So this build is perfect for a Half-Orc. I would definitely, see, it's, it's not required, but it's kind of required, you know, if you catch my meaning. And as for our final skill proficiencies, we're also going to be grabbing Perception and Nature, because I don't think this guy would have Animal Handling, and it's all that's left to us. At Barbarian level 2, we're going to be getting Reckless Attack, allowing us to always gain advantage on our attack rolls whenever we like, which is going to matter quite a lot for this build. Next up at level 3, we're going to be able to pick up our subclass, and I'm, of course, going with Berserker. Although the subclass for this build doesn't matter as much, it depends on kind of how you want to build it, you can kind of change things up. Wild Heart or Wild Magic will absolutely work, but for the strategy I'm going for, we're going with Berserker. Berserker is going to turn our range into a Frenzy, like giving us a few options as a bonus action. That being Frenzied Strike, allowing us to make additional weapon attacks, and Enraged Throw, allowing us to pick up an item or creature and throw them at a target, dealing additional damage and potentially knocking them prone. Our Strength affects how much weight we can throw, and heavier items deal more damage. This is where the uh, potions of Strength come in really, really nicely, because a 21 or a 27 in Strength means you can freaking throw even regular humanoids really fast. Far. Uh, and the damage of our thrown weapons is the same as the weapon's base melee damage, which is also really nice. So if you wanted to start chucking weapons around, you absolutely could. And you'll also deal additional damage based on your strength. Our throws are going to be absolutely insane. So yeah, we get those two abilities. Now, it's entirely up to you if you want to take level 4 here and gain the extra feat. I'm only going to be getting two feats with this build, and trust me, it's all we'll need, uh, because I'm going for a 3-9 split, and you'll see why in a minute, but if you feel like the things we get from level 9 of our multiclass aren't really that important, uh, you can go for a 4-8 split for an extra feat if you like. But we're going to be going into our multiclass now, and we're going to be going with Paladin which may seem like an odd choice, but hear me out. Paladin is going to give us a few things that I really, really like for this build. Namely, we're going to get Lay on Hands. The thing is, a lot of Paladin's features aren't considered spells, despite having spell-like abilities, and as such, uh, you'll, be able to, you'll be able to use them while ranging. Lay on Hands is one of those things. So in addition to being quite a tanky frontline fighter because of Barbarian's natural damage resistances, Lay on Hands is going to allow us to heal ourselves as well, which is great. We're going to have four Lay on Hands charges by the end of this build, so that's a lot of healing. I believe by the, by the end of this build, the Lay on Hands greater healing is going to heal us 36 HP, so we can just keep going, which is insane. A uh, Divine Sense would allow us to gain advantage on attack rolls against Celestials, Fiends, and Undead. We already have that, thanks to Reckless Attack, so that doesn't really matter too much. And finally, we also have Healing Radius, allowing to heal ourselves and allies for, hit for a, a few hit points. I would probably just stick to Lay on Hands. <laughs> now, as for our subclass, Oath of Vengeance would probably make sense, but honestly, we're going to be breaking our Oath here. So please give me one moment to go and do that. And there we have it, our Oath is broken. So, at level 1 of Oathbreaker, we are going to gain, spi or level 2, I guess, or level 1, yes. So, we'll gain Spiteful Suffering. Spiteful Suffering is going to allow us to basically mark an enemy at a cost of a channel Oath Charge. That target is going to take an extra 1d4 necrotic damage each turn, and we'll have advantage on attack rolls against them. So, it's just a nice little bit of extra damage we can get, in addition to everything else we'll be doing. So, next up, at Paladin level 2, we're going to be getting all of the stuff we like from Paladin. Divine Smite, allowing us to add an extra big dollop of Radiant Damage to our attacks. We'll have level 3 spell slots by the end of this build, that's why I wanted to go to level 9, which is going to be a pretty decent chunk of damage. However, we're also going to be able to gain, uh, you know, crit uh, Divine Smite on a critical hit, which means that when we get critical hits, which we will be able to do a lot with this build, thanks to advantage from Reckless Attack and a couple of pieces of equipment and items, uh, we will be able to hit very, very, very hard. 
We're also going to be picking up a fighting style, such as great weapon fighting, allowing us to reroll one or twos on damage die whenever we're using a two-handed melee weapon, which we are. As for our prepared spells, it's a bit tricky. Obviously, we can't cast spells while raging, so we might as well pick up a few things that can persist through rage or basically have to pick and choose when we do rage. Unfortunately, anything with concentration isn't really going to work, and of course we can't cast spells, so I feel like we could just kind of pick up the um, like special effects mites here with Searing, Thunderous, and Raffle in case you don't want to go straight into your rage. I mean, Raffle Smite makes a ton of sense here, allowing us to frighten enemies, which just makes sense for this character. Thunderous Smite to push them away, and Searing Smite to do extra fire damage. I kind of have like a fire damage buff on this weapon already, so it kind of makes sense. I've, I would say Compel, Duel, and Command could could also be useful to kind of go into before you rage perhaps if you want to kind of mess with your opponent a bit but overall we're probably just going to be sticking with rage not these aren't going to matter too much at level three of paladin we're going to get some things uh divine health prevents us from being diseased we're also going to be getting control undead and dreadful aspect i don't care about control undead so much for this build but dreadful aspect is really nice allowing us to allow our darkest emotions to burst forth as a menacing pulse to frighten nearby enemies this whole build is just about being very very powerful and putting the fear of not god the fear of us into our enemies the fear of you because you because there are no gods where you stand that was cringe as hell <laughs> Anyways, we're also going to be picking up a couple of Oath spells. We get Inflict Wounds, which can be nice, but Hellish Rebuke actually has some utility on this build. Larian still haven't fixed the fact that you can cast reaction-based spells while ranged, so you can actually use Hellish Rebuke on this build. You will have seen it in the combat footage. So, I mean, it exists. We're probably going to be wanting to save those um, spell slots for smites, but it exists. Next up, at Paladin level 4, we are going to be grabbing a feet as well as an extra lay on hands charge which is always nice as for our feats, we're going to be doing something very similar to the Wandering Swordmaster, and we're going to be picking up Great Weapon Master. Great Weapon Master is going to allow us to, whenever we land a critical hit or kill a target with a melee weapon attack, which, again, we're going to be doing a lot. This build is very, very much going to be getting crits, as well as killing targets just with our sheer power. You'll be able to make another melee weapon attack as a bonus action that turn. So you're basically always going to have the opportunity to get off a bonus action attack as long as you're just absolutely wrecking people, which is nice. Uh, but also, attacks with melee weapons we are proficient with and are wielding in both hands can deal an additional 10 damage at the cost of a negative 5 attack roll penalty. We can toggle this on or off. This means we're going to be getting even more power out of our two-handed attacks. And of course, because we gain reckless attack from Barbarian, this negative 5 attack roll penalty essentially doesn't matter. We're always going to be getting pretty much this passive's full power, which is amazing. At level 5 of Barbarian, we're going... Uh, level 5 Barbarian? Level 5 of Paladin. We're going to be getting extra attack. Now, obviously, getting extra attack at total level 8 sucks. So, if you want to adjust the levels of this build, maybe you just want to go all the way in Barbarian or Paladin first, and then respec later, you absolutely can. Just be mindful that with this build, obviously playing an Oathbreaker means you cannot respec. You'll have to restore your Oath before you can respec and then break it again, which is going to be a pain in the ass. But we kind of have to do it. I mean, you don't have to play this build as an Oath Breaker. You can play it as an Oath of Vengeance, and I think it would also still work. However, if you're playing this as an evil character, it's going to be very, very hard to keep your Oath. So I just kind of said, you know what? Oath Breaker works. So, but like I say, feel free around to play around with the levels of this build. Maybe go to level 5 in Paladin first before you get the Barbarian stuff. It's entirely up to you. But with level 5 of Barbarian, we're getting extra attack, which is great for us. We're also going to get access to level 2 spells, including our Oath spells, which are Crown of Madness and Darkness. Obviously, Darkness can be used on this build, but obviously not while raging, but it could be another way to kind of give yourself a bit of extra tankiness if you're in a pinch. And Crown of Madness makes enemies go mad with fear, I guess. Again, we're not really casting spells with this build. Although there is a couple we can cast here, Aid being one of them, just giving us a little bit of extra healing, but I would rather have the Cleric in the party do this. Protection from Poison would just give us, I mean, resistance to poison damage and not allow us to get poisoned as easily, so it could be useful. And then finally, Branding Smite. Might as well just get all of the uh, kind of special smite spells while we're here. 
Next up at Paladin level 6, we're going to be picking up the Aura of Protection. Ourselves and nearby allies are going to gain a plus, are going to gain a bonus to saving throws equal to our Charisma modifier. For us, at a 16 Charisma, that's going to be a plus 3. So not the highest, but definitely might as well have it. And at level 7, we're also going to be picking up Aura of Hate, allowing us to deal an additional uh, bit of damage equal to our Charisma modifier. Um with our weapon attacks. So again, for us, that's an extra three damage, which isn't a lot in the grand scheme of things, but hey, three damage over potentially three attacks per turn, that's an extra nine damage, that's not bad. Again, if you decided to go for maybe like a different leveling spread where you got an extra little bit of, uh, you know, like an extra feat and you're able to put your uh, ability scores into uh, charisma, this would obviously go up a bit, or you could use some equipment. It's entirely up to you, but I think you'll find that the equipment I've chosen for this build works out pretty nicely. And yeah, we don't need to really think about any other spells, I don't think. And finally, at Paladin level 8, we're going to be picking up uh, another feat. And, I mean, I'm kind of treading a similar ground a lot here. Uh, we're going to be grabbing Tavern Brawler. And you could pick this or Great Weapon Master up first, it's entirely up to you. But the reason I want Tavern Brawler is because we have a lot of ways to use improvised weapons and throwing, allowing us to add our strength modifier twice to the damage and attack rolls. Basically, this just means that because we're using these potions of giant strength, which can give us up to 27 strength, our throws as a guaranteed bonus action attack will allow us to reposition enemies, deal massive damage, stack with some other features that we're going to be getting later as well and just basically have full battlefield control, allowing us to attack multiple enemies at once by picking one up and throwing it at another, and we're going to have a really high athletic score, which is which is the skill you need to pass in order to throw enemies. Basically, this whole build is just about being a pure battle ranger. Swing your massive club, grab a guy by, the, by his armor and just throw him at another enemy. Like, it's all about just being this absolute force of wrath, and I think it works perfectly. Tavern Brawler is also a half feat, and since we don't need to level strength at all, we can bump up our constitution to a 16 here. And finally, at Paladin level 9, we're going to get access to level 3 spells. We do actually get Animate Dead here, which we yeah, might find some useful, but I honestly think the rest of it won't really matter too much. I would say that for spells, I mean, pick whatever you like, it really doesn't matter. Again, we're not exactly going to be using these, but Warden of Vitality could get some use. This isn't a spell that you necessarily have to concentrate on, so you might be able to kind of use this while you're raging. I don't know, I didn't test it, I probably should have remembered to test it. Someone let me know if Warden of Vitality works while raging. I think it does. And Blinding Smite, just to kind of complete the special smite kit, I guess. We've collected them all, except for Banishing Smite, which only Bards get. Still salty about that one. And that is the build. Overall, you're going to be getting a ton out of this build. Guaranteed Great Weapon Master, pretty much with thanks to Reckless Attack. Uh, massive smite damage because of our ability to deal a lot of critical hits, again, with advantage and some stuff I'll get into in a minute. Divine Smite is just going to give us a ton of power. The ability to heal yourself with Lay on Hands, uh, dealing, like I said, a pretty decent chunk of healing out of our 116 hit points. And the ability to give yourself buffs with things like Aura of Protection and Aura of Hate, as well as things like Aid and such as well. You will be an absolute powerhouse without any sort of, with just a couple of the buffs I have. Our main hand weapon attacks are going to be doing anywhere from 25 to 35 damage per hit. And a full Divine Smite, which has an awesome red blood aura here, which I love, we're going to be doing upwards of 67 damage. This is not including critical hit reactions, which could be absolutely devastating. Can you turn around, please, Mr. Oni? Thank you very much. Yeah, get, get back into your pose, your fancy pose. And also, we're going to get extra things from, like, Spiteful Suffering, which can add even more damage. Like, there's just so much. And we're able to even control the battlefield with being able to threaten our enemies and throw them around. So there's just a ton to this build. There's a lot of utility. There's healing, massive damage, battlefield control. This build has everything. So it's interesting to see how using both Great Weapon Master and Tavern Brawler again in a, in a build, but the build's playstyle is completely different. Uh, instead of going for, you know, battle maneuvers and such like that, we're going for smites. Instead of going for flurry of blows as a bonus action, we're going for throwing to give us battlefield control. These are two builds that kind of 
again, oppose each other. They have similar kind of aspects to them. There's reasons that they are somewhat the same, but there's enough to make them different, both in their gameplay styles and their narrative, that make them opposed to each other, and honestly, perfect rivals, in my opinion, or at the very, maybe even enemies. I don't know, roleplay this one, have some fun with it. But let's get into the equipment, which is where this build is really going to shine. In a odd twist, again, I don't think this is something I've ever done before, I've gone for a fully complete armor set here, this being the Bone Spike set. This means we're going to have the Bone Spike Helmet, meaning that when we rage, hostile creatures within a 3 meter radius must succeed a Wisdom save or take Psychic damage, and the target receives half of that damage on a save. It gives us even more intimidation, but also menacing attack, meaning that even though we're not a battle master fighter, we still get this attack. It doesn't consume superiority die, and it does an extra bit of bludgeoning damage, uh, extra bit of damage on top of our usual damage as well, and can possibly frighten targets. We can use this once per turn, so if you're not using Divine Smite, you have no reason not to be using this. It's just free extra damage and a potential status condition for even more control over your enemies. Absolutely perfect, I would be using this 100% of the time. Next up is the Bone Spike Garb, which gives us 15 temporary hit points whenever we rage, which is nice, and we reduce all incoming damage by 2, and when the wearer is struck with a melee attack, the attacker takes 3 piercing damage, so we become even more tanky and even retaliate with every attack done to us that's melee, which is insane. We're also going to get the Bone Spike Gloves, allowing all of our attacks to ignore resistance to slashing, piercing, and bludgeoning damage, meaning that no matter what, our big uh, Oni Club is going to be doing massive damage. And finally, the Bone Spike Boots, giving us a plus one bonus to armor class and saving throws, as long as we are not wearing armor or holding a shield. Our jump distance is increased a bit, and we get access to Brutal Leap, allowing us to, whenever we jump at a target, we can possibly knock them prone as well. So, a bit of extra uh, movement as around the battlefield, and the ability to knock enemies prone, which which is always nice. The only thing that I would say this build is definitely lacking in with this armor set is the AC. We only have a 16 in dexterity and a 16 in constitution overall, meaning that even with our boots we only have a 17 AC. I've not placed a cloak on this build for pure fashion reasons, but if you were to place the cloak of protection on this build, that's a plus one AC, rounding it out to a much more decent 18. However, since these are all level uh, act 3 armor options, I do have some earlier game options that may also be something you might want to keep around instead. Uh, the Haste Helm, you can get this right at the start of Act 1, which just gives you momentum at the start of combat, which means you're going to be getting a boost to your movement speed. This is quite nice as a melee fighter, it just allows you to immediately close in and start swinging without having to dash or something like that. Uh, as for your armor sets for Act 1 and 2, for Act 1 you could pick up the Graceful Cloth, giving you a plus 2 to your dexterity, which would essentially mean that you would have more armor class and you would have a bonus to your dex saves and increased jump distance as well. Or you can go with the Act 2 option, the Enraging Heart Guard, which while raging will allow you to generate 2 turns of Wrath, although I think that's bugged right now, and for those of you that don't know, Wrath gives you a little bit of extra damage on your melee attacks, not a lot, but a little bit. However, this would give you a plus 2 to your constitution, again increasing your AC and giving you more HP, so you might find that you prefer to use one of these overall instead of this, but I personally think the Bone Spike Garb is the way to go. If you don't care about ignoring damage resistance so much, and again just need an earlier game option, the Braces of Defense are ideal. As long as we are not wearing armor or holding a shield, which we're not, we're using clothing and holding a two-handed weapon, we can just gain a plus two bonus to our armor class for free. So you might find that this might be more important than overcoming resistances, getting that 19 can absolutely be a bit nicer, it looks a bit nicer on paper, but I feel like with the amount of tanking that we're going to be doing, we're not going to care as much as if we're hit, I mean you'll see the combat footage, we're healing ourselves, we're taking zero damage from me from like melee damage, you you'll see, it's not going to matter too much, uh, but I think overcoming resistance on our enemies is much more important. And finally, I kind of didn't really know what to put in this slot, but I think the line breaker boots would work just fine, especially if you pair them with the enraging heart garb, allowing you to gain wrath whenever you dash. You probably will be dashing to get close to enemies anyway, so, you know, just getting a bit of extra damage off of it is not bad, but you could throw something like for disintegrating nightwalkers on here. Pretty much anything will work so long as it's not considered like armor, so just do what you gotta do. And finally, we have our key weapon of choice. The Rat Bat, our Oni Club itself. Now, the Rat Bat, at first glance, isn't anything special. Normally, it is just a flat plus one weapon uh, with, that has advantage on attack rolls against beasts. So, nothing really to write home about. However, 
it does have a secret feature that I have tested and can confirm is true that isn't listed in the game anywhere. It's not listed on the weapon. It's not listed in the weapon attack description. It only comes up when you attack with the weapon and you see it in the combat log. This weapon, in addition to the normal D8 of damage it would normally do with your strength modifier and all that, it does an additional 1D6 piercing damage coming from, you know, the spikes that are on the bat. For some reason, this isn't mentioned anywhere at all, but it is there, so it's a 1d8 plus a 1d6, which is really nice. Uh, it doesn't get any bonuses from things like uh, Great Weapon Master or anything like that, it is just an extra d6 of damage, but hey, we take those. I've also decided to buff it to a plus 2 weapon with a bit of extra fire damage, thanks to the Drake Throat Glaive's Draconic Elemental Weapon, just giving it a bit more of a boost so it feels more on par with other weapons in Act 3. However, you'll see that with everything that we have here like I say with our you know great weapon master and all the other buffs that we're stacking or with something like menacing attack um we don't it's not exactly going to matter we could do this with a freaking toothpick and we would probably do tons of damage but let's quickly go over the accessories as well. I've gone with the Brood Mother's Revenge. Again, we're not exactly using the most powerful weapon in the world, so giving ourselves a bit of a 1d6 buff, uh, poison damage buff whenever we are healed, either through Lay on Hands or through our Ring of Regeneration. This basically just means that we'll be able to constantly get even more damage out of our attacks, and that bit of extra poison is always nice. And finally, we've also got the Killer's Sweetheart, which means that whenever we kill an enemy, we gain a kind of bankable reaction that we can spend whenever we like to guarantee a critical hit. The ring of the ring's description is a bit misleading. It says your next attack run will be a critical hit, but really it's actually just a kind of reaction that you can just spend whenever, and you can do it once per long rest. So mixing this with, um, you know, the fact that we have advantage, that we have a guaranteed crit as well, we're going to be critting quite a lot. In fact, we even have some extra ways of doing it because I'm including the Elithid powers in this build. Uh, the only really active Elithid power that I want to talk about here is Psionic Overload. Basically it kind of feels like to me you're, at, you're entering like tier 2 rage because you can stack this on top of your regular rage and I would make sure you gain you get the Awakened passive to be able to use this as a bonus action or you could I guess you could keep it as an action so you can do this and rage on the same turn. It's entirely up to you but basically what Psionic Overload is going to do is going to give you an extra 1d4 of psychic damage to all of your attacks, but you take 1d4 psychic damage every turn. Remember that with the Bone Spike Guard, it reduces all damage by 2, so you're only going to ever take a maximum of 2 psychic damage from this ability, so you're going to be getting a pretty good damage buff. Again, we're stacking a lot of damage buffs here to gain a lot of attacks. Now, the rest of the Elithid powers I would go for are fairly passive, but I will go over them. As for a literal passive, we have Cull the Weak. Whenever you bring a creature down to 15% HP or lower, it dies and all nearby creatures take 1d4 psychic damage, basically allowing you to just kill enemies way earlier than you normally would be able to and spread damage around. Again, your frenzy just blows shit up. It's amazing. We also, as a reaction, have Luck of the Far Realms, allowing you to, whenever you make a successful attack roll against a foe, you can change it into a critical hit once per long rest. So that's two guaranteed crits per long rest, which means two guaranteed full power smites. And again, with our advantage and all that, we're going to be hitting crits way more often, so it's pretty nice. Uh, as for our other Elithid power that I want to talk about here, there are a couple. I'll just pull up my document to make sure I don't forget any. I... Uh, Yes, I think, oh, the only other one I would get that I don't have here, but I will have on screen now, uh, is Survival Instinct, basically allowing you to, whenever you would hit zero hit points, be able to get back up with a little bit of HP. You get it from doing a quest in Act 1, I won't spoil anything, but ch check the uh, links in the description. Uh, where the wiki pages for all of that information are available. But the final kind of passive elephant power that I want for this is Displace. Creatures suffering falling damage because of your actions take an additional 1d8 psychic damage. This counts when we throw them, because throwing does falling damage. So, whenever we throw enemies, we're also dealing additional psychic damage to them, which is awesome. And finally, I'll be going over our main sources of strength here. Uh, the kind of earlier tier potion you're going to be getting is the Elixir of Hill Giant Strength, which sets your strength to 21, and the Elixir of Cloud Giant Strength, which you'll get in the later game, which sets it to 27. Uh, the combat footage you'll be seeing, I guess now, because that is the build, but also uh, you would have seen a bit of it at the start, does use the 27 variant, because this is an Act 3 test, and I thought you'd get this potion in Act 3, so I decided to be a little bit cheeky, but the 21 Strength Potion will still do 
just fine. And as you can see, despite some potential hang-ups of maybe slightly lower AC and all this and that, we do a ton of damage, like absolutely shred our foes. Basically, if we choose someone to be the vic to be the recipient of a divine smite, uh, they don't survive. And our regular weapon attacks and our throwing damage do enough to keep the entire battlefield in check. Uh, and we are very, very tanky. We don't take a lot of damage from a lot of our enemies' attacks, and we're constantly dealing damage back to them thanks to the bonus by garb. And then, in the end, you'll see that when we do get to about half HP, I'm just able to heal back a huge chunk of it thanks to lay on hands. So yeah, overall this build is extremely strong, uh, but here is the question, is this build stronger, the same or slightly weaker, than my Wandering Swordmaster, which is kind of a similar concept done in a different way? And honestly, I have no idea. They both have their strengths. I would say the Wandering Swordmaster is definitely, you know, less likely to get hit overall and still deal quite a lot of damage thanks to Flurry of Blows and stuff. But then again, we have Divine Smite on this build, as well as the ability to use Menacing Attack as much as we like. So we're kind of always getting that Battle Master damage buff. It's hard to say which of these builds would actually win in a pure damage competition or hell if they were even to fight each other. I mean, probably the only if we're being honest, because as soon as you hit a smite, they're probably just done. But, I don't know, I feel like this, these builds, while being somewhat similar, I guess in the feat choice, the fact that the classes and subclasses interact in many different ways, and the equipment changes things, and the, um, uh, the fact that this build uses a lifted power, the fact, despite the fact that they are somewhat similar concepts, the execution is completely different, and I absolutely love it. Uh, anyways, a uh, couple of channel updates. Um... I mean, this build's going up on the mon on the Monday, so I guess, yeah, uh, starting this weekend, uh, you guys may have noticed up until now that I've been uploading modded builds to the channel, or, you know, D&D videos, or basically just extra stuff on the weekends. Uh, I'm sorry to say that's going to be stopping for a while. Uh, I decided after my unfortunate break where I had, you know, when, I, when I was ill and I had to take some time off, I would upload extra videos on the weekends to uh, kind of make up the difference. But to be honest, it's not worked out. Uh, long story short, these extra videos I've been uploading are usually my lowest performing ones, and the fact that they take extra time away from me um, being able to do other things, like life stuff and personal projects, I've decided to can the um, weekend videos for now, going back to three videos a week with a stream on the weekends. This is just going to help me uh, be able to work on more stuff. I want to play more games that might be good fits for the channel, like, um, you know, finally maybe do some Elden Ring stuff, maybe and, maybe and like finish Dragon's Dogma 2 to see if that might be worth playing on the channel. Some people have expressed interest of me doing just like gameplay videos where I'm just kind of chilling and vibing and like going maybe going through my build making process as I play through a game I don't know about that one so much I don't think that would be very entertaining because usually when I play games I just kind of sit around like yep uh-huh okay that attack was bullshit so I'm probably not gonna do that but if you express but if enough people are interested in it I'm sure I could give it a try but that feels like it might be more of a live stream thing rather than an actual gameplay thing so feel free to check out the live streams by the way, for those of you who were at the live stream uh, this past weekend, <laughs> I hope it was a good time. Anyways, uh, I, yeah, I don't think there's much else for me to say. Obviously, the big channel update is that there's going to be a slight reduction in uploads, but other than that, and, and the fact that I might be possibly experimenting with more things in the future with different games, uh, and yeah, I mean, modded builds will return when Larian gives us the official support, the official modding tools, and the ability to download them on console. Then I'll go absolutely crazy on that stuff, but for now... I'm going to take it back a little bit. Just take it back now, y'all. You know, th that was awful. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's anything much else to say, but, like, again, I guess thank you for the continued support. Uh, we, we're probably going to be hitting 8,000 subs in a couple of weeks or so. That'll be fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, the goal is still 10k, so hopefully we'll eventually get there. But, yeah, you know what? I'm going to stop rambling. I kind of wanted to keep the dialogue going so that the combat footage can finish. Uh, but we'll see. Um, anyways, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time.